So I had to go see an oncologist. I saw a wonderful man by the name of Robert Decker. And he sat me down. He said, Marla, you've got aggressive cancer cells going. Even though it's early, we have to give you aggressive chemo. We're going to give you cytoxin and adriamycin. There's some side effects. Got to tell you what they are. Some of them might happen. Some of them will happen. I said, okay, go ahead. Tell me what they are. He said, well, you will go into chemically induced menopause. You might become sterile. You will lose your hair. You might get mouth sores, anal sores, bleeding gums, bleeding nose. Your white cell count will drop. You might get infections. You will gain weight. You might get leukemia or uterine cancer, and you may have permanent heart damage. Well, I was astounded. Wait, wait, Doc, back up a bit. Did you say I was going to gain weight? Saturday with Ted continues on News Talk 1010. There you go. That is uh, the uh, wonderful voice and the uh, brilliant mind of Marla Lukowski, my guest in studio. God, it's good to see you. It's great to see you. When did we meet? We met like in the 70s, didn't yeah. we? We had Frenchie McFarlane on earlier. He said to say hi to you. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, there you go. Where was that recorded? That was recorded at the big hangar at uh, that Downsview Airport. Yeah. And they hold affairs, and so Mount Sinai Hospital decided to do a yoga-thon breast cancer fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And so they asked me to do 30 minutes, and I said, well, actually, my show's an hour. I said, well, can you do it? And I said, okay. And I just winged it from the top of my head, and, uh, and I was standing in a room full of 200 women on yoga mats staring at me, which was a really odd you know, yeah, that's kind of really a, are. a weird gig. Yeah, it was a really weird gig. The, the weird thing was um, that when I took the stage and I took a step to the side, I fell off and the host that introduced me caught me. So I could have had a really bad, and then I would have been doing a paraplegic, you know, benefit soon, you know. But <laughs> anyways, thank God they caught me. But I continued on and it was very <clears throat> successful. And, and very unique. It was back in uh, 1998 that you were diagnosed with breast cancer. Spread to your uh, lymph nodes. That's right. Now, you, you laugh at it there, and it's in a very funny piece, but must have just scared the hell right out of you. Actually, uh, it was odd. It kind of didn't. I had some sort of premonition when I found the lump, which I thought was just uh, something from an old uh, mononucleosis situation where there's, you, you know, your um, lymph nodes get swelled. Uh, it was just one little, little, little... My lump was less than one centimeter, which is remarkably small. It was six millimeters. And that's why the doctors <coughs> were shocked that it had already spread to the lymph nodes. Because 3% of people, that will happen to. And that's what I talk about in my speech, is that somebody's that 3%, mm -hmm. it might be you. So think about these things and prepare for it. it do the best you can. But I wasn't, I wasn't scared. I kind of thought, yeah, I'm not surprised. Okay, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. The doctors were more frightened than I was. I was more frightened of how do I tell my parents? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's I, I hadn't even thought about that, but you're right. That That is a tough thing. And, and, and being a parent, uh, it's like, that's the worst thing that you could imagine is your child being really sick or, or, or dying. It's mm -hmm. got to be the worst thing possible. Yeah. And I was living in Los Angeles at the time and they were in Toronto. So I had called my sister, Elaine, and I said, I need you to tell them. And she said, great, we're seeing them this afternoon for tea. I said, okay, tell them. And then everybody started to call and the phone started to ring. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, they acted very calm and they just said, well, tell me, tell me what the next step is and do you feel you want to come home? And I said, no, I've met some great doctors. I feel really confident with these, these doctors. They treat me with respect. Um, I think I'm going to be in good hands. Um, I know you want to come down and see me, so why don't you come down? And so they did, and and then I had one operation, and then and then I asked them to go home because the family dynamics and tension, and I just needed some peace because I was coping in my own way, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I started the chemo and the radiation. Now, how long, how long did you battle? Well, the whole process of the fight and the fight makes you sick. I felt great at mm -hmm. the time. Um, it was six months of treatment, and it took about a year for my body to feel and my head because now they call it chemo brain my head was pretty fuzzy uh take me about a year to feel like myself but it took another year for my hair to grow and it grew back in a totally different pattern and uh and my arm that kind of got you know operated on because of the lymph node removal 
And that took a long time. And you have like lifelong conditions once you have lymph nodes removed. So you have to be careful about that stuff. And they're changing things now. As of this year, they're doing things a little differently with the surgery and stuff. But it was a rough road because I acted, uh, sorry, I reacted really badly with the chemo. And everybody has different chemos and everybody has different reactions to chemos. Mm -hmm. And there's many different types of breast cancer. And people aren't aware of that. So I educate the audiences when I talk about this. And uh, and I like talking about it, and it feels like actually much more gratifying than doing the stand-up. I loved the stand-up, you know, for the 30 years of my life, because you know, I started when I was a fetus, so, you know, <laughs> I looked pretty good for my age of And a fine-looking fetus she was when we first met. <laughs> yeah. What's that thing? Hey, oh, that's the umbilical cord. Don't so, pay no attention. Yeah, how, how long were you out of action, as it were? Like, how long? You were saying that the, the treatment took about a year or so. Mm-hmm. So during that period of time... Uh, were you thinking that this might become an inspirational speech or the basis for Not at all. some sort of a comedy routine? That's a great question. What happened is I couldn't work. I was sick as a dog. So I started to write. Uh, so I started to write every day, and I kept a journal. And I thought, maybe one day I'll publish this journal because I'm going to write the truth. I'm not going to talk about just be positive. I'm not going to talk about think of the silver lining. I'm going to tell the truth, and that's going to help people. Because I read an article in the L.A. Times of a woman who was writing this article every week of her cancer journey, and it helped me because she told me how sick she was. She told me how dizzy she was. And so when it happened, I wasn't shocked or surprised or concerned. And so I decided to keep this journal. And then nothing happened with it. I moved back to Toronto years later and got readjusted, and suddenly my parents died. And... And then I broke my leg a couple of months after my mother died. So it was a very bad time. I'm stuck in my apartment with a cast from my toe to my hip for six months. During that time, I had a friend visit me. I handed her my journal. She reads it and she goes, this is fantastic. You should do something with it. I said, like what? She goes, well, rewrite it. You know, I'll fix it up with the grammar and try and publish it. Well, I have tried, but... No takers yet. You know, every Canadian publisher always says, well, we have our eight bucks for the year or so, but, <laughs> but good luck with your endeavor. It, it's uniquely funny for a serious <clears throat> subject. Um, but also, another friend came by and read it, and she goes, you should turn this into a speech. I went, you mean I have to write again? I just went on. She says, yeah, don't worry. You know, I'll help you. We'll take it chapter by chapter, and we'll, you know, we'll compress it. And she says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to suggest you to a speaker's bureau said, no, don't. I don't even have the speech written yet. She goes, don't worry about it. So she submitted me to the Speaker's Bureau. Mm-hmm. Within a month, they called me and said, you're booked. I said, so I said, great. I didn't have the speech written. <laughs> of course, my friend says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I said, Every time someone says, don't worry about it, something bad happens. She goes, the gig's in a year. You got a year. <laughs> Let's start writing. Yeah. So... And and, it. and it's called uh, I'm Still Here. And so is my hair. And so is my hair. Yeah. yeah. Marla Lukowski, uh, my guest, will come back and, and talk more. And if you're wondering where those uh, strange little voices are coming from inside this woman, uh, you'll find out more about that in a moment on News Talk 1010. some of my dates. He took me out to Baskin Robbins for um, a milkshake with two straws, and I thought that was really romantic. It was for each nostril. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. That's got a deja vu-ish there. Well, did you recognize the laughter? That was you. That, that was what, you that... on your talk show. You had a fabulous talk show on television. Oh, that was off the wall. Yeah, it was w- off the wall. W-O-L. Yeah. Yeah, good Lord. Um, Jesus, good to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you. Um, you, you're talking about the, this, this battle that you, that you went through, this journey through, through hell, really. Uh, are you all cancer free now, clean, good to go, or? I'm, I'm clean to go for now, but it's an ongoing monitoring <coughs> situation. Sure. And, uh, the battle in Canada, particularly Toronto, is you have to fight for every screening test. Uh-huh. Now, I was getting them regularly. But uh, as of a couple months ago, I was just informed that they're not going to be giving me any more screening except a mammo. And I said, but the mammo doesn't pick up my lumps because I have dense breasts still. In fact, the MRI that I had shows that I have these two lumps that you've been monitoring for two years. 
but the mammo is negative. Oh, yeah, you're right. I said, so how can you cut off my MRI and my ultrasound, which doesn't give me radiation poisoning like the mammo does? Oh, well, it's just a system now. Bye-bye. So I'm on my own right now. So I have to Jesus. either decide to go back to L.A. and pay for my own tests. Or just bounce over to Buffalo every once or in a while. bounce over to Buffalo. But you know what? The shopping's better in L.A. <laughs> so I'd rather spend a thousand dollars and get on a plane and get some sunshine and have some healthy food. In the time that you've been speaking and, and delivering your message and, and sharing your, your your thoughts and and what you went through, you must have touched an awful lot of people who came up to you afterwards and said, "Thank you so much for that." Yeah, boy, did I ever! And that's when it struck me. Oh my God, I found my calling. I had people come up to me <coughs> at a conference, a big one. Uh, it was like uh, a thousand people. Two people had come up to me in different times after the show and told me they're going to be dead in a couple of months. And they said, you still inspire me. You inspired me to feel comfortable. You inspired me to know that I did my best. And I kept in touch with these people. And then one day I didn't get an email. And then I got a death notice. Mm. And that moves me, of course. It yeah. moves me when um, people, a lot of people come up to me and they, they hold me and they start to cry. And it's just very emotional because they say, you say what I can't, my family will get upset. You tell people how to treat us because everybody wants to avoid it. You know, when I was reading through your stuff and you talk about how people are, are still afraid to even mention the word cancer, and I, I, there's an old Woody Allen movie. I don't know if you remember this scene. There's, it could have been Annie Hall or Woody Allen sitting around, and it's a very, uh, uh, obviously he's not, but everybody at the table is a very waspish kind of, and they're talking about Auntie, uh, Auntie uh, Georgina. She has, uh, she has cancer. Oh, yeah. Cancer. Yeah. See. Yeah, like it's just what they wouldn't even say it out loud. Right, right. Now, I, I would imagine that as much as you're, the, the inspiration that you give people makes you feel good, but you're also seeing an awful lot of pain all the time. How do you carry that around with you? I mean, do, do you not want to just sort of turn the corner and say, can we just do jokes now? And No, no, not at all. I, because you know what? I, I can't stand small talk. I can't stand it when I say, so how no, you are you? you came to the wrong place then. <laughs> <laughs> Love yours, though. Um, I don't like it when I say, so how are you? And they go, fine. I went, so what's new? Well, my mother died and I got my leg amputated. I said, well, why'd you say fine? I actually like to know and want to know. I like real. Yeah. I like real. I like honest because sometimes when you talk about that stuff off the top, you actually can start to laugh about something. Like, that's what happened when uh, I lost my mom, which was my last parent. And I, I started to say the Kaddish, which is uh, an 11-month, twice-a-day Jewish prayer ceremony and I would go to the synagogue that I didn't know and I started to meet these people and I connected with this woman named Sandy Offenheim who um, we started to connect and we would go downstairs for a bite to eat and we'd all cry and stuff and then we'd hang out later, her and I, and we'd just start talking about our real gut feelings and then we started to laugh. We laughed about something that was funny and then we couldn't stop laughing and then I remember the janitor walking by and saying, are you sure you two are from the mourners group? Went, yeah, what are you talking about? Well, I got to pee, I got to pee. Me too, me too. That's funny. Um, you've done so much uh, voiceover work and so many uh, cartoons over the years, Super Mario Brothers. My Pet Monster, which was one of my favorites as my kids were growing up. Uh, I want to discuss uh, this when we get back, talk about that, okay? Don't forget the Care Bears. And, well, no, of course not. How can you forget the Care Bears? <laughs> Marla Lukowski, my guest, stay with us. We're back in a moment on News Talk 1010. You're listening to Saturday with Ted on News Talk 1010. It's a good thing this isn't on television. You won't see what kind of a clutch I am. I almost poked my eyes out with my headphones. And had I done that, I would have had to sue both Dan and Tony because they got me these for Christmas. And that's just the way it goes in the real world. I'm sorry, guys. 225 News Talk 1010. Uh, comedian Marla Lukovsky, internationally renowned. And I'll tell you why. I, in, you may not recognize her voice, but you'll recognize so many of, of her face, but you'll recognize so many of her voices for so many years. The Care Bears. Yeah, it doesn't what matter. a break that was. Huh? Yeah, unbelievable. Whatever I've done in my life, um, 
it doesn't matter. I've got an Oscar. I, I got a, you know, a Grammy. I got a, da, da. and they go, yeah, 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 yeah. But you were good like Bear in the Care Bears. Oh my God! Can you talk like that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, hui, oomph, 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 you know. <laughs> and they go, oh my God. Yeah, but do you want to talk about my Nobel Prize? No, no, no. Do the Care Bears again? Yeah, hui, you know. <laughs> That's a playful heart monkey. Is that the that's, name? That's that's no, the good, good luck, luck bear. bear. Good playful luck bear. heart monkey is very <laughs> similar. Just <laughs> it's just a little more squeaky. Well, I want you to do me a favor. As good luck bear, can you say welcome back to the, to uh, Saturday with Ted on News Talk Ten Ten? Well, I wish you would write the script. Oh, you know, I will. Here, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, Saturday okay. with Ted. Okay, okay, on good. News <laughs> Talk. Okay, I got 10, it. Ten. All right. Welcome back to Saturday with Ted on 1010 AM radio. Yeah. Hold on to that. We'll be using that in the future many times. <laughs> do you do any uh, voiceover at all anymore? Uh, I still go on auditions. I told my agent a while back, I said, don't send me out on, on camera stuff. I don't dig it. I don't want to feel like a piece of cattle sitting in a room with everybody kind of looking like me and kind of not. And uh, I just said, let's just do radio and voiceover stuff. And so, but it's hard even getting the audition. Oh, you days. know what? I, I've had so many people come to me and say, you know, I've been told, Ted, that I have a really good voice and I'd like to, uh, I'd like to do commercials. I said, I, I, I will help you in any way I can possibly can. But let me tell you something. You're running uphill into the wind. Yeah. It is a son of a B to, to, to yep. get in there. And then when you do get to call for the audition, you walk into a room there's 25 guys there, and you sit around for an hour. You go in, and you read four lines on a piece of paper, and you're out of there in a minute and a half. They say, thanks very much, and you don't hear from them unless you get the gig. That's right, and everybody's totally competent who's sitting in that room. Everybody. And they all have the demo tapes, so they could pick. You know, years ago, you know this, they used to just book you. Yeah, no, it's not anymore. Not anymore. And you're competing against, uh, in, you know, in, in voiceovers, you're competing against guys who are in radio, uh, people who do a narration, actors, singers. Uh, it, these Some of them are big, big names, and you're thinking, oh, good Lord, and you just drove an hour and a half and, you know, got a $30 parking ticket. It's a tough, tough go. Exactly, exactly. And I only say that because I'm hoping that everybody <laughs> pulls out at just me. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Well, you've got a great voice. I mean, you know, there's a reason why you're on radio. Well, you can have a voice like this if you abuse yourself over a certain <laughs> amount of time. Well, I used to sound like this, but now I sound like this. <laughs> um, the Care Bears, I don't know, how, how, how many years ago was that? It was um, 1985, and I remember when I got the call. And, um, so was that like 26 years ago? I, I can't believe it. Just saying those wow. decades, I just can't believe it. But I remember getting the call from my agent, and they said, you're good luck, Bear. And I went, I I'm what? You're good luck, Bear. Show up at this studio, and you're going to do, you know, 25 episodes. Okay. I had no idea it would turn into such a huge thing. It was massive. It was massive. Massive. And, and how, how they, many, did a, they did a couple of years of the series, the episodic and the things, movie. and then they did two movies. So I made, you know, I was living off that money. And it was buyout clause, Canadian ACRA buyout clause. So, but still, the interest rate then was thirteen, fifteen percent in the bank. I was living off the interest, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it was fantastic. So, how many years did the Care Bears were they your friends? I think we did it for two years, mm -hmm. and and then it was just reruns and stuff, which you don't get anything. I get a residual check every five years for about $3 <laughs> for universal <laughs> use and planets outside of the solar system yeah. for 10 years, $3. <laughs> the stamp cost $4 to send me that notice. Yeah. That's that's the deal with that. So. Yeah, but that's got to be a lot of fun uh, in, in a studio doing something like that. It was it, really it, a lot so, of fun. So silly in, in one sense. You think, this? what am I doing here for a living? Well, I know I'm doing providing a lot of entertainment for a lot of young kids. Well, I'll tell you, one of the lines... And a lot of stoned older people. Oh, well, yeah. Well, for sure. So many people say, I grew up with that. And absolutely. I remember seeing one line in the script, <clears> and it said, Yagada, Yagada, Yagada. And I said to the uh, director, I said, what, what is this? And he said, well... Your Care Bear just got a bunch of snow on its head, and it needs to shake it off. So you have to shake it off and make that sound. 
So the sound was. <laughs> That's how I learned how to you make the what? sound of shaking snow off my head. <laughs> I always wondered how you spelled that. Yeah. You got a, a few more minutes to hang around? Sure. Okay, good. Uh, Michael Bain is going to join us uh, in after the news as well, uh, or after the break uh, with the paint party. I hope you don't mind, Michael, if we just get you to hang for a couple minutes. All right. I didn't think so. He seems like such a nice man. Uh, Marlo Lukowski is my guest in studio. We'll return in a minute. News Talk 1010. Welcome back to Saturday with Ted on 1010 AM Radio. Yeah. I told you that would show up. I had no idea. There you go. It's fantastic. It's not many people in in this industry, my friend, and I deserve it after 37 years to be introduced by Good Luck Bear. That's right. (laughs) <laughs> Only the best for Ted. I think I've hit my pinnacle. I think I, I don't think I can do uh, much after that. Uh, you, you and I first met when you were doing stand-up, and um, and it was probably 1978. Yeah, back at uh, back at Yuck Yucks when Yuck Yucks first started. I started at uh, Friars Tavern with Gene Taylor and yeah. Martin Short and Rick Moranis. Uh, that was before Yuck Yucks was built, and Larry Horowitz was there too. Mm-hmm. Did, did you ever go to Young and Dundas? Uh, uh, Gene Taylor? Yeah. I went there once, and my first time, I had, uh, my first time that I did stand-up comedy was when I was in high school. I worked at a, at a strip club, okay. Darvin Marvin. I can see that. And then I wanted to get, really get into it, and Gene invited me to come to uh, to, to the Friars, yeah. and I was trying to battle the nerves. I got hammered. I sucked. <laughs> it was mm. terrible. Yeah, but then it, it got better after that. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember you. You, you know, very... You know, you have a really great stage presence. I remember you on stage. I mean, your head was almost hitting the ceiling. Well, at Yuck Yucks, yeah. Yeah, yeah, at Yuck yeah. Yucks. It was, uh, and I had to watch watch out for uh, Mark Breslin. Cause Everybody. He was much had. short, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. Yeah, never mind. Never mind. He's carved himself out a, 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 a fortune. Yeah. Do, do you miss doing stand up, stand up? Good question. Because I do at times. Yeah. I do a lot of MC work, but at, at times, mm-hmm. you know, and you throw in liners and you yeah, work yeah. material in, but. I kind of do. I don't miss the pressure. I don't miss the, uh, the politics. I don't miss the travel. Yeah. I hated that most of all. I don't miss sitting around and waiting for my name to be called and sitting in the green room. But I do miss the immediate response of the audience. Mm-hmm. I do miss the magic of the bond and relationship that happens and winning somebody over to get them to laugh when they don't want to. And I miss the high and I missed the money because you would get paid. Boom. Hey, that was a nice chunk of change for doing, mm-hmm. you know, 10 minutes of something. Um, but it really took a toll on me physically and mentally. And uh, I, in that way, I never really want to do it again, except like you say for, you know, emceeing something. Or I do a lot of comedy in the speech that I do. Yeah, yeah. I'm still here and so is my hair. There's a lot of comedy sprinkled throughout it. And there's a lot of drama and some acting and lots of voice work and stuff like that. So, um... Um, anyways, I don't miss it, but I, I, I do love that piano playing. What the hell was that? Where did that come from? <laughs> Somebody would just, uh... No, Bill is not even the in the room here, Tony. That just kind of showed up on its own there. Yeah. Tony's dream... Yes, that's it. Tony's gone into a dream sequence <laughs> now. Uh, the, 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 the stuff that you do in, in your, in your, in your act... I'm thinking with our conversation that we had about about this, people saying, be positive, be positive. Yeah. There's probably a million people out there who have battled cancer mm-hmm. and, and go on speaker's tour, and that's what they that's what they preach. You're right. It's that Tony Robbins kind of You're thing. You're exactly right. So I had an incredible letter come to me after my first speech from a woman who said, I've been to every Tony Robbins, I've been to every cancer survivor speaker. You are the first person to be honest you are different you're refreshing you're real keep doing what you're doing i want to see you again and then i knew i'm on the right track and that's why i think people really really are moved by me now who who hires you like what kind of places do you play you um, corporate, I, corporate gigs there's corporate gigs um, i had a nice one they flew me to miami for uh Glaxo Smith Klein drugs. Mm-hmm. That was very nice. And um, I've done some high schools this year, which was really actually moving because I didn't think the grade 12 would get it. They not only got it, but they all started to write me about their personal problems, of which I did not respond to. I just said, call your therapist. But 
I mm-hmm. I just said, stay in touch with your feelings, don't block them out, and speak to somebody. But what happened is because essentially my speech is about facing adversity, not winning, not overcoming, facing the adversity and dealing with it. So people started to share these problems. I had people coming out to me, I lost my brother, you'd understand. Uh, my boyfriend just dumped me, you'd understand. It was all these things. And I've also done um, <clears throat> cancer benefits, of course, and also cancer conferences. But I've also done living rooms. Uh, women's chapters would say, can you come over and speak to my women's chapter? And I can speak anywhere for anyone, small or large, because the message is not just about cancer. That's what people say. Your story is not about cancer. It's about life. It's about everything. It's about what happens. And what do you do when it happens? And how do you approach somebody when they're going down? Yeah, because adversity happens in, in so many different ways. So many. And it happens to everybody. To everybody. At one point or another. That's and exactly in right. varying degrees. Exactly. Right? So if you can get something out of this, it's like people say, well, I, you know, I, I can't really relate to her because I don't have cancer. Ah, but you've got this or you've had this. Yeah, well, that's adversity. Yeah, exactly. And um, one thing I do is I suggest to people, this is what you should say to somebody who's just been diagnosed with cancer. And a lot of people come up to me afterwards and go, I love that part because I got a friend, I got a sister, I got a brother, and I don't know what to say. So I avoid them or I bring over, you know, a casserole or whatever, whatever. And you told me what to say. And the first thing is very simple. How are you feeling? Mm -hmm. I want to know how you feel. And however you feel, that's okay. Don't tell them how to feel. Don't tell them what to do. Ask them. That is the most powerful (laughs) phrase anybody can say to anybody, if you think about it, Ted, is how do you feel? And actually somebody sit there and actively listen. People don't listen anymore, by the, the way. The problem is with that question, how do you feel? That's just, it's just bandied about. It's, it's, it's thrown around like, um, like, like, like fruit. You know, it, it's meaningless. Unless somebody actually, because nobody answers it with any truth. That's right. Everybody, we're, we're like robots. That's right. How are you? I'm fine. Good. How are you? Great. Right. <laughs> exactly. There's your con- the That's average the person. Problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. You're right. You're right. And so, you know what, when I approach somebody and they say, great, and fine, I went, okay. That's also what I advise. I say, if they don't want to talk about it, leave it alone because it's not, it's their journey. If they're ready to open up, listen. If they're not, leave it alone. But at least you tried. Well, because typically when you do the, how are you great, how are you great, Mm -hmm. that leads to uh, a meaningless conversation over the next two or three three days, or two two or three minutes, I should say. Yes. And you think, um, I don't even know why I had that conversation with that person. I didn't get anything out of it. They didn't get anything out of it. Absolutely. That that wasn't wasn't worth it. Absolutely. You know what? When my mom was dying, and unfortunately, and I uh, helped take care of her, and I was like with her 24-7, eight months of suffering with leukemia, and she didn't want to talk about it, but she didn't deny that she, she knew she was dying. Mm-hmm. But I was just so wanting her to talk to me and tell me how she felt, but she never did. And I'll always be upset about that. Yeah. And I didn't want to probe. It was her privacy. I would just watch her and hold her and, and that's it. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's that person's choice because that's their, their level of comfort. True enough. That's it. I'm glad you made it. Well, to thank that, you. And I'm glad you made it to the studio. Thank you. Can can I read one little... You can do anything you want. <laughs> well, I have to say, first of all, it's an honor to be here. It's incredible to see you again. You're one of the best talk show hosts I've ever seen. That's very You should have your own TV show, but I'm glad that you're on radio. And uh, I, I wanted to share with your audience this little, little ditty that I wrote. And it happened one night uh, while I laid in bed um, after receiving hours of chemotherapy. And I was too weak to get up, so I'm lying on the bed, and a mosquito flew into my bedroom, and it bit me. And I wrote this little poem, which is, Last night a mosquito bit me. It sucked up my poisonous blood. I watched it fall fast to the ground, and all of its little black hairs fell out of its little black legs. It was stilled forever. Good. That's what you call sweet revenge. (laughs) 
That's very funny. I don't know if you got it, but see, I my blood it. was poisoned, and it said, hey, great, I'm going to suck up her blood, and I went, uh-oh. You should have rented yourself out during that time. <laughs> Rent yourself out to parties and barbecues. Yeah, oh, right. we're just mosquitoes over here. Here, have some of this blood. You'll enjoy exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Just hang me on a tree. And, you know. It is great seeing you. Give me it's a big fantastic one. seeing you. Take care of yourself. Yeah, you come back, okay? Come back here. Anytime, and, um, baby. And bring all your Care Bearer people with you. You bet. Okay. <laughs> if, I, if, if I ever call you late night, really late at night because I'm drunk and ask you to do that, just hang up on me. Hey, if I get to come back, I'll do The Wizard of Oz in three minutes. Oh, jeez. Yeah, you forgot that one. Uh, I'm, I'm not no. going to do it for you. Damn it. You you can't do it now. Can nope. You? All right, you got to come back and You've do You've got that. some great people this coming is, up. This is hilarious. I, I'm telling you, yeah. and you're talking about one of my favorite Pieces. favorite movies yeah. of all mine time. Mine too, mine too. Marla Lukowski, uh, you got a website? Tell me where people can go. I do. www.marlalukowski.com. It's that last name that's going to kill you. L-U-K-O-F-S-K-Y. Yeah, L-U-K-O-F-S-K-Y.com. Yeah. See you soon. Okay. Seriously. Great. Talk to Dan in there. Okay.